with this process happening, with them just pulling in more and more fuel and growing in size, are there foods that can actually restrict these fat cells from growing slash cut off their nutrient supply so they won't continue to get as big? Yeah, before we talk about fuels, let me just sort of foods, let me just say that actually our body has its own kind of like regulatory switch. So here's the thing. Uh, we talked about insulin uh, that rises in the body as a response to eating. Basically, food's coming in, energy's coming in, your body senses it, it makes this hormone um, uh, insulin, and insulin actually helps to draw that energy into regular cells as well as store, store it into fat. Now, here's something really important about normal healthy fat. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about normal healthy because understanding the normal allows us to understand the abnormal. If you just jump to kind of like the, the demon, all right, then you miss the good guy part of it, right? This is just like, uh, you know, kind of like uh, it's not black and white. Um, there's a transition where fat is good until there's too much of it and then and then it actually becomes harmful and what we want to do is respect our fat and tame it not vilify it and not try to cut it out suck it out you know and poison it so normal fat i mentioned is an organ and that organ is an endocrine organ it's actually like a thyroid like a pancreas like an adrenal gland and this is quite amazing to think about fat as an actual organ and it releases about 13 different hormones all right, hormones are just proteins that are made and released by an organ, go into the bloodstream, and they go elsewhere in the body to help to control different kinds of functions. So one of the things that fat does as an organ, it releases leptin. Leptin is sort of an appetite regulator. It turns up and turns down your appetite depending on the number, about the volume. So it controls your behavior, okay? And the reason I'm mentioning this is that, you know what, when the leptin is high and it turns down your appetite, you don't want to eat so much guess what less fuel less need to keep storing that stuff in number one number two it produces a super powerful hormone called adiponectin now many people may not know this term adiponectin but if i were to draw your blood sean take it to a lab ordinary hospital lab and measure all the hormones in your body your adiponectin levels and mine by the way would be one thousand times higher than any other hor uh, hormone in your body, higher than your thyroid, higher than your testosterone, higher than any other organ. And the reason is adiponectin is what allows insulin to pull that energy in to your cells. It's another hormone made by fat, by good healthy fat. We need that fat to make to get our energy, our basic energy. All right. Now, there's one more hormone I want to talk about. It's called resistin, made by fat. And resistin basically is the break to the gas pedal of a diponectin. So if a diponectin at a thousand times higher than any other hormone in your body helps insulin pull fuel into your body, into your cells. Resistin is the break to basically say, oh, whoa, let's a little, let's slow down a little bit. Normal balance, right? So the life is all about balance. A diponectin, resistin, leptin. These are just three of the hormones in normal, healthy fat. Here's the thing. When you've got too much uh, uh, fuel that needs to be packed up and those fat cells get hundreds of times bigger and then they replicate and stem cells make more and more fat and they get bigger and they get hypoxic in the middle and they start dying because they can't get enough blood supply, what happens is that inflammation actually derails your normal fat's ability to produce these, organ these hormones. Leptin gets screwed up. Now you, can, you don't know if you're hungry or not. You can keep on eating. It's worse, okay? Now you can keep on loading more fuel. Your adiponectin gets screwed up. So now you, even though you're eating and you've got all this energy, now your body can't pull it into the cells. doesn't even store it very well. And then the resistant goes haywire. So basically it doesn't know that you should slow it down or speed it up. And so basically it's kind of like uh, uh, over um, as, as excess fat grows. It's basically like creating chaos and air, air traffic control. Nobody knows where to land the planes. And so this causes even more chaos. So the important thing is how do we actually tame that excess fat? And so the body can do some of it by itself. Like our, our body is hardwired to know how to tame fat to some extent.
Not if it goes too crazy. But secondly, and this is sort of like the surprise, is that there are certain foods that can do it as well. But the, how your body does it is actually incredibly important because when we're not eating, okay, fasting, when we're not eating, like when we're sleeping, all right, insulin goes down and our body basically says, oh, when the insulin's down, we can burn fuel. When insulin's up, can't burn the fuel, can't tap into those fat uh, cells, the fuel cells. When insulin is down, like when we're sleeping, it goes, all right, not eating. We need to pull into, we need to draw into our fuel cells. Let's pull some energy out. And it starts to actually burn extra fuel by burning extra fat. So when we're sleeping, our body's hardwired, as our metabolism is hardwired to start burning down extra fuel. And this is really kind of the basis of thinking about intermittent fasting, uh, you know, timed eating. Uh, you know, the longer we give our body's natural metabolism, our hardwiring to burn that fuel, the better it is. Now, it turns out that certain foods, and this is the big surprise that I write about Eat to Be Your Diet, certain foods can amplify that effect, not just when you're sleeping, but even when you're eating. So it's an override. You can actually use food to override that system. So even though your body's not supposed to be burning that energy, it goes, let's just, let's go ahead and burn some ener energy anyway. It's fascinating. Fascinating. One of the things that I love about your work and your book is that you're reframing food as well, because a lot of times we see food as an enemy and you're saying food is not the enemy. It's actually the solution. You know, um, food is a big contributor to so many of our problems. If we're talking about obesity, if we're talking about excess fat gain, and it's also the solution, right? And so choosing intelligent foods, because that's the thing, these foods, it's not just food, it's information. And there's an intelligence underlying all of this stuff and how it's influencing our metabolism. So at this point, let's get into and circling back to my initial question, when talking about the growth of our fat cells and angiogenesis, the creation of those new blood vessels, let's talk about first in this fat loss equation, what are some foods that have anti-angiogenesis properties that can help to cut off that nutrient supply to fat cells? Well, this actually goes all the way back to my research in the uh, late 1980s. I was super interested in finding ways to fight cancer by cutting off the blood supply. So I worked in a lab and we were, we were looking at, uh, before pharmaceuticals were developed, biopharmaceuticals were developed for this area, we were looking for natural sources. And, the, and, um, and we're looking for anything in nature that could give us a clue uh, of, of how nature might provide a natural chemical that could cut off the blood supply to cancers. Now we knew actually, even back then, like licorice could do it, stuff in licorice could actually cut off the blood supply to tumors, feeding extra cells from that you don't want to be You're growing. not talking about Twizzlers. What's that? You're not talking about Twizzlers, are you? We're not talking about Twizzlers. So, I'm not talking about Twizzlers. I'm actually talking about licorice. And it turns out that there's a natural chemical found in licorice called isoliquitrin. All right? Now, as a researcher, one of the things that we're able to do is to know something's in a natural compound, take it out and test it in the lab. We tested isoliquitrin on blood vessels that are grown to feed harmful cells like tumors, like tumor blood vessels. And it actually powerfully stopped those extra blood vessels. But the thing that really brought it home for me, and uh, I've never forgotten this, is a research study that was done by a, a Greek researcher working in Switzerland. Uh, his name was Ted Fotsis, and he looked at the urine of uh, villagers outside of Kyoto, Japan. These villagers were all vegetarians, they ate mostly soy, okay? And, and he had frozen jars of this urine, and his boss, his supervisor said, you know, go find something interesting to do with the urine or toss it out. So he went to look for hormones inside the urine, thinking that he was a hormone, he was an endocrinologist. So he was interested in looking at hormones. When he ran the urine underneath this thing called a mass spectrometry, okay, you see these spikes. And he found a spike that didn't belong in the human. And it only came from the soybean. And it was a spike of genistein. So he cut out that spike, which we can do in the lab, 
and he tested it on blood vessels that would be feeding cancer. It immediately stopped those blood vessels from growing. And so this was to discover that genistein found in plant-based foods like soybeans could actually be anti-androgenic and they could cut off the blood supply feeding cancers. It really was a mind-blowing uh, discovery. And I read this, uh, and, I, and I know Ted Fosis, um, we had this conversation about it, and it was absolutely amazing to think about what other secrets might be in food that could help to control the blood vessels. Now, now remember, earlier we talked about the fact that growing fat needs extra blood vessels, right? So it's trying to grow those blood vessels. If you deliberately cut off the blood vessels to, that are feeding fat, all right, it'll actually shrink the tube. It'll shrink tumors, and it'll also shrink fat. So although the tumor wants to grow more blood vessels and it can't, so it starts to die in the middle. If you then step in and do an intervention to really cut off the blood vessels, that fat mass will shrink. And this has been shown very conclusively in the lab that this can actually happen. Green tea, another, the catechins, EGCG, powerful anti-angiogenic, uh, can cut off the blood supply feeding tumors, can cut off the blood supply feeding fat as well. So. One of the reasons I really came up to this whole idea of body fat is not only my background in this research, thinking about, well, maybe fat growing the way that we talked about, cloning itself, getting bigger and bigger and bigger, hypoxic in the middle, that to me re resembles a tumor exactly. And so the question is, could we tame the tumor by uh, taming the blood supply? And I remember the work that was done earlier, and it turns out that many of the foods that I wrote about in my first book that are anti-angiogenic. My first book being Eat to Beat Disease, more than 300 foods. There's a whole chapter on anti-angiogenic, cancer-starving foods, or blood vessel-taming foods. And I started to realize here was this whole opportunity to look at ways of taming our body fat as well. And the epidemiological study supports it. Wow.